So when do you think you go on our field trip? Uh, probably sometime in January. I haven't talked to her yet about it. <laughs> okay, January sounds so far away because I feel like I'm still in September or October. And it is December. That's how I was like, I was like, October, like, flew by. I still think we're like, six Wait, okay, okay, let's look at, okay, these two things that we're going to look at today are actually two uh, developmental theories on how we age, how we learn, and so forth, um, and Piaget's particularly is, is geared for kids, and um, Eric Erickson, his stages of development go throughout the whole lifetime. So these are two um, theorists, okay? They're like psychologists, and um, basically they did observations, and then they came up with these theories of how we develop. You know, we talked about this the other day, kind of theories are just, you know, they observe and they see a pattern of things. I've been able to observe lots of people and determine that they go through, people kind of tend to go through the same stages and the same periods of life and so forth. So again, these are not concrete, okay? They're very generalized. Some people go through one stage earlier than others and later than others and so forth. Let's look at Eric Erickson first. Um, and if you guys take a psych class, which if all of you guys are going into healthcare in some form or fashion, you're probably gonna take a psych class at some point. Um, a psychology class, I think I took three, so um, kind of depends on, I don't, I don't even know that nursing laws, they require that many more, I kind of think it's just two, but I took an intro, and then I took a child and family development class, that was a psychology class, and then my other one was an abnormal psychology class, so we learned more about different diseases and so forth. But these are all things you'll hear about later on. So Eric Erickson, um, he has, he kind of, like I said, observed, came up with this theory that there are these eight stages that we go through in life. Uh, so look at this first one, infancy. It says birth to 18 months. Um, the ego development outcome, this one is termed trust versus mistrust. I see my circle that because it's not very big on there, but you'll hear that. Trust versus mistrust. So what do you guys think that might mean? Building your trust with your child or the way they trust people. Okay. Yeah, it affects later on how they trust people. So look, it says Erickson also referred to infancy as the oral sensory stage. Um, you know, you think about babies, they put everything in their mouth, so that's kind of one of the ways that they learn. It says where the major emphasis is on the mother's positive and loving care for the child with a big emphasis on visual contact and touch. So this is, you know, we talked about this the other day touch and talking to babies and all that is really important um, and it's not always just the mother it's, it's basically whoever the primary caregiver is whoever they're with the most that's who they have to build that trusting relationship with it says if we pass successfully through this period of life we will learn to trust that life is basically okay and have basic confidence in the future we fail to experience trust and are constantly frustrated because our needs are not met, we may end up with a deep-seated feeling of worthlessness and a mistrust of the world in general later on. Okay, so this is birth to 18 months. So that was his theory is that, you know, either you're taken care of as a child and you can learn to basically trust the world, you know, like you kind of go through life and you can just live it out and be okay and trust that things are going to happen. Um, or if you're not cared for, not talked to, not touched as a baby, then you would go through life potentially not trusting anyone, feeling like the world's going to fall apart at any moment. So, it says, incidentally, many studies of suicides and suicide attempts point to the importance of the early years in developing the basic belief that the world is, a trust, is trustworthy and that every individual has the right to be here. So, anyways, interesting. Thoughts? What do y'all think about that? I think it's true. I think we definitely see, you know, we talked about that sensory disorder. We definitely see, definitely see repercussions if babies are not. And, and this is like, you know, they're just not cared for. Okay, let's keep going. Early childhood, 18 months to three years. So one and a half to three years. Look at this ego development outcome. Autonomy versus shame. Sometimes you'll see shame and doubt. 
autonomy. What does autonomy mean? Say that again. Like talking about their motor skills and everything. Um, it's different than that, but that was a good yeah, that's what I was thought. Auto means self. So autonomy is kind of like your right or your ability to make decisions for yourself. You know, we talk about client autonomy a lot in, in the healthcare field, and that's someone's ability to make their own decisions for themselves. Okay, so autonomy is kind of like, and you think about it, what do we know that children at this age, what are they learning and doing? Walking, talking, push boundaries a little bit, because what are they exploring? Their, their environment, their independence, right? They want to be more independent. Okay, like, Anything like my child, she won't let me help her do anything. So can't help her, can't hold her hand while she goes upstairs. She won't let you help her put on her clothes. A okay. hey, basic strengths, self-control, courage, and will. It says during this stage, we learn to master skills for ourselves. Right? And it's a big time period of mastering those things. Walking, talking, putting on clothes, eating by themselves, drinking by themselves. So not only do we learn to walk, talk, and feed ourselves, we're learning fine motor development as well, like the toilet training, that happens usually in this time frame. That's another independence uh, thing. So here we have the opportunity to build self-esteem and autonomy as we gain more control over our bodies and acquire new skills, right from wrong, so forth. As one of our skills during the terrible twos is our ability to use the powerful word no may be attained for parents, but it develops important skills of the will. So that's just a normal phase that kids go through. They're expressing their ability to make decisions for themselves. Okay. I'm not saying you should let them make all their own decisions, but that's just a, you know, that's just the nature of them figuring out their boundaries, figuring out that they can do things on their own and so forth. Uh, most significant relationships says are with parents. Uh, so it's also during this stage, however, uh, we can be very vulnerable if we're shamed in the process of toilet training or learning other important skills. We may feel great shame and doubt of our capabilities and suffer low esteem later on as a result. Interesting thought. Again, these are not concrete. This isn't like every kid who has toilet issues is going to grow up and have these issues too. It's not saying that. Saying generally speaking, this is an observation that you made. You came up with this theory. Um, it's like you studied people. Oh, yeah. Well, all these, they're all sociologists. That's what they all did, psychologists. So, definitely. And you think, you know, scolding a kid is, is, you know, a few times, but if they're shamed in that process, as in if they're made to feel stupid in that process or if they're made to you know what i'm saying over a repeated pattern of that all kids are going to have you know there's been moments i've gotten on to hannah because she beat him for whatever you know uh play age so three to five years initiative versus guilt basic strength is purposes during this period we experience a desire to copy the adults around us you definitely see three to five year olds doing that and take initiative in creating play situations. So we're coming up with these, you know, imagination, pretend, make up stories with Barbies and kids, toy phones, miniature cars, playing out roles in, you know, in the, it says in a trial universe, experimenting with the blueprint for what we believe it means to be an adult, right? They'll, you know, want to sweep and mop and vacuum or take care of babies or drive cars or dump trucks or whatever. We also begin to use that wonderful word for exploring the world. Why? Oh, God. Well, my cousin is going to do something she wants. Why? Why? And the answer, why? I'm going to Yeah, I'm so annoying. That's part of it. While Erickson was influenced by Freud, he downplays a biologic, biological sexuality in favor of the psychosocial features of conflict between child and parents. Freud had the... Um, a lot of his developmental stages were based on sexuality. And, uh, anyways, they're kind of out there, but he was another theorist, kind of like Dan. And it says, nevertheless, he said that this stage, we usually become involved in the classic 
Oh, 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 Nicole, I can't talk, struggle, and resolve the struggle through social role identification. And it, that doesn't really, I think about this. It says if we're frustrated over natural desires and goals, we may easily experience guilt. So if we're made to feel, if kids are made to feel wrong um, about, it says natural desires and goals, then they can experience guilt, which will affect them later again most significant relationship is family and we'll see that on up until you know adolescent years okay school age so industry versus inferiority what do you think that means okay um let's read it. it says during this stage often called the latency period, we're capable of learning, creating, accomplishing numerous new skills and knowledge, thus developing a sense of industry, right? We are kind of be able, to, able to create our own things, we do projects at school, we do school plays, we, you know, play instrument, whatever, you know, you're kind of gaining some things that you figure out that you're good at or not good at or whatever. This is also a very social stage of development. And if we experience unresolved feelings of inadequacy and inferiority among our peers, we can have serious problems later on. That's pretty evident, wouldn't you agree? Especially later in elementary, I would say. Um, definitely. As the world expands a bit, our most significant relationship is with the school and neighborhood. Parents are no longer the complete authorities that they once were, even though they're still really important. Adolescence, identity versus role confusion. What do you think that means? Yeah, figuring out who you are, right? Uh, basic strength, devotion and fidelity. So it's up to this stage, according to Erickson, development mostly depends upon what is done to us, right? Things happen to us. That's kind of what shapes who we are up to this point because we've been very dependent on the people around us to provide needs. From here on out, development depends primarily upon what we do. Y'all agree with that? Up mm -hmm. to this point, you kind of change, switched over. You can make your own decisions regardless of you know what decisions are made for you, for the most part, not always. And while adolescence is a stage at which we are neither a child nor an adult, life is definitely getting more complex. We figure out our own identity, struggle with social interactions, and grapple with moral issues. So figure out what you believe is right and wrong. That's what that's talking about. Our task is to discover who we are as individuals separate from our family of origin and as members of a wider society, right? Figuring out if, you, if you're different than your family, you think the same way as your family or you don't, or just figuring out who you are outside of that. Unfortunately for those around us in this process, many of us go into a period of withdrawing from responsibilities, which Erickson called a moratorium, if we are unsuccessful in navigating this stage, we will experience role confusion and upkeep. A significant task for us is to establish a philosophy of life, right? So what do you think about life? What do you want to do? And in this process, we tend to think in terms of ideals, which are conflict-free, rather than reality, which is not. Do you all agree with that? You kind of have an idea of what you want your life to look like, and it's kind of like staged out perfectly. But reality is, it's you know, there's going to be bumps along the way. Kinda like when you get married and you think you're going to live in a castle like Cinderella, and everyone's going to live happily ever after. And then you realize that that person is a person just like you. And they make mistakes just like you, and they're selfish just like you, and same idea. <clears throat> Problem is that we don't have much experience and find it easy to substitute ideas for experience. However, we can also develop strong devotion to friends and causes. Uh, we kind of figure out what we're passionate about. So, most significant relationships are with peer groups. Young adulthood. So, intimacy and solidarity versus isolation. Okay, so think young adult. What, are most, what happens to most people during that time frame, 18 to 35? Go to college. Go to college. Get married. Else? They get married. Right? So marriage is, is kind of primarily what it's talking about. <coughs> 
In the initial stage of being an adult, we seek one or more companions and love. And it doesn't just have to be marriage. It can just be friends, too. As we try to find mutually satisfying relationships, primarily through marriage and friends, we generally also begin to start a family, um, though this age has been pushed back for many couples who today don't start their families until their late 30s. Yeah, well, you know. So that's weird to 50 me. years ago, people started having babies at 18 and 19, and now a lot of them can be young at the late 30s. Still babies. <laughs> do what? Babies are still but, Oh, well, they do. They were getting married at like I'm 16. I'm saying, right. Saying 50 years ago, 30 years ago, people as a whole got married a lot younger and had kids a lot younger. Now we wait until we're like 40 to have kids. That's weird. Yeah, that's generally speaking, that's not saying everybody does that, obviously. Um, let's see. If negotiating this stage is successful, we can experience intimacy on a deep level. We're not successful, isolation and distance from others may occur. And when we don't find it easy to create satisfying relationships, our world can begin to shrink. Um, and we feel superior, we can feel superior to others. Middle adulthood. Generativity versus self-absorption or stagnation. So it says now work is most crucial. Erickson observed that middle age is when we tend to be occupied with creative and meaningful work and with issues surrounding our family. Middle adulthood is also when we expect to kind of be in charge, right, the role that you always want. So you think when you enter the working world, you're kind of like on the lower end of the totem pole, but you want, by, the, by your middle age, you know, most people want to be up, you know, move up, like manage people and that kind of thing. Not everybody, but. The significant task is to perpetuate culture and transmit values of the culture through the family and working to establish a stable environment. Strength comes through care of others and production of something that contributes to the betterment of society. So we're looking, how can we better society? Like, what can we do for other people? What, are we, what can we do for our family? Um, this is what he calls generativity. So when we're in this stage, we often fear inactivity and meaninglessness. So people, that's one of their fears at that age, is that doing things that don't matter. As our children leave home, relationships or goals change, uh, maybe faced with major life changes and a life crisis. You know, we've all heard of that. We're going through the midlife crisis. And then struggle with finding new meanings and purposes. You know, a lot of people really struggle when their kids move out. Because here they've had, you know, 20 years of their kids living at home and doing everything, you know, going to ball games or going to school functions or going to whatever else and then all of a sudden the kids leave and what happens you have, you have no life yeah you, you they're at home or you know married couples a lot of times find that they haven't been as close because there's been so much going on with the kids and so then the kids are gone and it's just then left you know and then it's awkward <laughs> it doesn't have to be but like, it could be my grandpa, my mom moved away, and he cried so much, like he had a panic attack, and he just like, shut down. Sad. Yeah, it's a hard, that would definitely be a hard time. As if we don't get through this stage successfully, we can become self-absorbed and stagnant. Right, don't look for other people to help them, and just stagnant. Late adulthood. So integrity versus despair. What do you think about that? Integrity versus despair. They're like, it's just like, uh, despair is like death, you know, they're getting older. Yeah, like depression, mm -hmm. death for sure. And integrity, just looking at things, what, you know, meaningful, so forth. Because Erickson felt that much of life is preparing for middle for the middle adulthood stage, and the last stage is recovering from it. So he's saying it's kind of like those first five stages, the first six stages. It's like you're building up to middle adulthood, and then it's like middle adulthood's over, and then it's like you're just recovering from it. It's kind of like anything else. It's like, you know, you kind of get to that place where you feel like you've arrived, and then you retire. It's like you work, 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 work to retire, and then all of a sudden you retire. And you don't 
have work to do with it more so you don't know what to do, you know. But uh, it's like that with everything, you know. It's like that having a baby. It's like you spend nine months, you know, with the baby gets bigger and you have this big anticipation. And then all of a sudden the baby gets here and you're like, oh, you know, you hear that postpartum depression. And that's, that's the same idea. You know, you look forward to something and then it gets here and it's awesome, but it just still doesn't quite, you know, it's still awesome like you think it's going to be, but then it's still a letdown because once it happens and it's gone, you know, does that make sense? So, and it's like that with everything. It's been like that even for me, like with this house, you know, we spent three months working on our house and not living in it so that we could get it finished and move in. And now we're in and it's kind of like, did all this work and I was just like, okay, it's a house, you know, I mean, it's, it's just stuff, you know. Okay, that's like Christmas for me. But I that's that, always yeah. come, like you wait way. for it and it gets here and, and like, it gets here and then you're just go. like, don't, yeah. you're like, dang, another year. And then we gotta wait like a whole that. other year for it to come back. And then it's like summer, you know, same thing. You go the whole school year. It's like summer, mm -hmm. summer, 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 summer. And all of a sudden, some, summer gets and here and it's like, it goes so fast and then. Summer gets boring to me. Like, I get bored. I need to. I feel like I just stay. But you know, that's what we're doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. that's what he's talking about, though. At the end of this, you know, stage of life, it's, it's that same idea. Like, you've had all this anticipation up to this point in your life, and then it's over, and it's like, oh, what was that uh, for? Yeah. Yeah, like, Christmas Eve is my favorite day, because on Christmas, I feel like it's already over. Like, uh, on Christmas uh, Day, I'm like, it's over already. <laughs> 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 um. So, yes, I'm about to the phone. It says, perhaps that's because older adults, we can look back on our lives with happiness and are content, uh, feeling fulfilled with a deep sense that life has meaning and that we've made a contribution. That's what he's calling integrity. And then, um, on the other hand, it says, some adults may reach a stage in despair at their experiences and perceive failures. They may fear death as they struggle to find a purpose to their lives. So, trying to figure out, did I do what I wanted to do? You know, is what I did... And it's like meaningful. And so that's what it's turned out with those two things. But all right, so pretty interesting, I think. I think stages, you know, they, they make sense. Again, they're not gonna be the same for everybody in every stage. And these ages are not you know, set in stone. I'm scared. I mean like I I know where I'm going with that, but I'm scared of that. Like I'm not ready. It's a it's a scary thing, you know. I mean it's a scary thing to think about. So normally, you know, it's kind of like we talked about the other day at, you know, at y'all's age and even my age, it still seems like it's very far away. But, you know, well, it's like, like I think about my grandparents, they just, my granddad just turned 90. My grandmother will be 90 next week. And, uh, you know, I just think, I mean, it's not likely that they'll live another 10 years to be 100. I mean, I could, but, you know, for sure not another 15 years. You know, what is it like to know that, to know that you don't have, you know, yeah. Gosh. I don't know. Or, or to be sick and know that you're not going to, I mean, that, I think that's yeah. where I'd rather it be unexpected than me having to be, like, with cancer. I mean, yeah. you don't know. I mean, there's both ways to that. One, you can prepare if you know. Okay, let's talk about Piaget oh, no. real quick. Let's look at Piaget. This is paper. It's a little bit shorter. So, um, Piaget was a biologist who originally studied uh, mollusks, it says, but moved into the study of development of children's understanding after observing them and talking and listening to them while they worked on exercises that he set up for them. Really interesting to me. So this is how kind of how we learn. Says, His view of how children's minds work and develop has been enormously influential, particularly in educational theory. His particular insight was the role of maturation in children's increasing capacity to understand their world. So they cannot undertake certain tasks until they are psychologically mature enough to do so. His research has spawned a great deal more, goes on. So it says he proposed that children's thinking does not develop uh, entirely smoothly. Instead, there are certain points at which it takes off and moves into completely new areas and capabilities. He saw these transitions that taking place about 18 months seven years, and then you get 11 or 12. Um, this has been taken to mean that before these ages, children are not capable, no matter how bright they are, of understanding things in certain ways, and has been using space for scheduling the school curriculum. 
think so this is just very basic, but anyway, it's kind of interesting. There's a few vocabulary words we'll make. Well, let's look at these. Adaptation, it says, what adapting the world through assimilation and accommodation. Assimilation, it says, the process by which a person takes material into their mind from the environment. Um, so it's may, which may mean changing the evidence of their senses to make it fit. So just taking information in, regardless of whether or not it makes sense. Accommodation, it says, is the difference made to one's mind or concepts by the process of assimilation. So that's changing our the way we think as a result of what we learn. Okay. Um, let's see, is there anything else in here? Conservation, the realization that objects or sets of objects stay the same, even when they're changed about or made to look different. So, um, you know, for example, let's say this box is purple and I put black paper over it. It doesn't mean that the box is black. It just means that there's black paper over it. The box is still purple. That makes sense? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Decentration. That's good. Decentration. Anyways, the ability to move away from one system of classification to another one. Talk about that. Egocentrism. This is one you'll hear about. Um, the belief that you're in the center of the universe and everything revolves around you. So the corresponding inability to see the world as someone else does and adapt to it. It's not really selfishness. This is an idea like like my child. You know, she's two and a half. You know, she, to her, the only world that's going on at any given time is right where she is. You know, she, she doesn't necessarily understand that there's, she understands, I don't know, she's kind of moving towards that anyway. Um, operation, the process of working something out in your head. Um, schema, representation, a set of perceptions, and so forth. Okay, so here's the stages. So sensory motor, birth to two years, it says they differentiate themselves from objects. So they go from, uh, I think about Micah in those last few weeks, he's really started looking at his hands. He's like realizing that his hands, he has control over him. You know, he like looks at them and watches them. Mm -hmm. You know, and that he's just mesmerized by them because he's realizing that he's got control over it. Um, and toys, it's the same same idea. He's realizing that, you know, they're not actually part of him. It says, recognizes self as an agent of action and begins to act intentionally. Pulls a string to set a mobile in motion or shakes a rattle to make a noise. Okay, same idea. Um, that's where he is. Achieves object permanence. Realizes that things continue to exist even when they're no longer present to the sense. So they realize that just because they can't, see things doesn't mean that they don't exist. So for example, this is a prime way. So if I'm in the room with my child and I leave the room, okay, when they're little bitty, they don't cry because you're just you're just not there anymore. You know? Whereas as they get a little bit older, closer to that two year mark or even one year mark, one to two and I leave, they start crying because they miss me and they realize that I'm not there. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Object permanence is in realizing that I can exist even though I'm not in the room. Okay, <coughs> next one. Pre-operational. Learns to use language and represent objects <coughs> by images and words. We know that. Uh, thinking is still egocentric. They have difficulty taking the viewpoint of others. So they have a really hard time understanding what something looks like from another perspective. They can't really, you know, they can only see from where they are. Classifies objects by a single feature. So groups together all the red blocks, regardless to shape, or maybe they only categorize square blocks. They pick one thing and categorize that way. And again, these are just processes, how <coughs> they think and learn and so forth. Concrete operational, because they can think logically about objects and events. They achieve uh, conservation of number. So look over here, conservation, the realization that objects stay the same even when they're changed about or made to look different. That's, they can understand that, like it says with numbers. You know, my child, for her, the number five 
mean, it doesn't, five, the word five doesn't mean anything, but she can count five things. But she can't understand that there's five, that five, she doesn't understand that concept of a number, you know what I'm saying? Um, let's see, mass, age seven, so understand that things weigh, and then weight or mass that they take up space and then weight. Classifies objects according to several features and they can order them in a series, you know, according to size. So they can do more organizational skills. So maybe they can put all of the <coughs> square and red blocks here and all of the square and purple blocks here. And start, you know what I'm saying? They can do more than one thing at a time. And then formal operational they can think logically about abstract uh, propositions and test hypotheses. So you can think about things that you can't necessarily see or put your hands on. Becomes concerned with the hypothetical, the future, and ideological problems. Um, anyway, so pretty, pretty interesting there too to think about. And those are things to think about whenever we start our teaching project. You know, the younger the kids, the more concrete things need to be and less complex. The older they are, the more complex you can get with your instructions and so forth. So anyways, I think that's really interesting. Okay, let's go ahead and that's that. Put those away. And I'll tell you for the test, as far as these go, it's really these are really, the questions on these are really general. You don't have to memorize these stages or anything. You just need to have an idea, like be able to explain mistrust, uh, trust versus mistrust and so forth. Just have an idea. They'll be short answers so you can explain them. won't be anything specific. The other thing you need to know is Piaget's is the education one, and Erickson is the one that's like development stage. And this pack is kind of thick, but it's really not that. Okay, what I want you guys to do tomorrow when I'm not here, we're about to talk about growth charts, but we're not going to put ourselves on here yet, and I'll let you guys do that tomorrow. So tomorrow, what I want you guys to do um, when you come in here is after you take your payday, I want you guys to weigh yourselves back here. Do y'all know how to use one of these? And then measure your height, and I'll show you how in a minute. And then I want you guys to plot those on this chart back here. And I'll show you that in a second. Has everybody seen a growth chart like this before at some point? The, the reason that we use growth charts, yeah, you probably, they always plot my kids on a growth chart and take them in for a well check is um, that gives them an idea of how you're growing. If you're growing proportionately at, to your size. Um, well, I may talk about this again next week, but uh, let's start from the beginning. It says about growth charts. Look at any class picture and you'll see kids of the same age in all shapes and sizes. Some kids look tiny next to their peers and others stand head and shoulders above. Um, it's easy to to make these comparisons and draw conclusions, but everybody really grows at their, their same pace. There's a wide range of healthy shapes and sizes. So some things that can affect it, genetics, gender, um, physical activity, health problems, all those things can affect how tall or short we are. So, so how does a doctor figure out whether a child's height and weight measurements are normal? Um, and if they're developing on track, because since everybody kind of has their own normal, well, they use these growth charts, okay? And they're standard. They get something that's measurable. You know, everybody can be plotted on the same growth chart and be measured that way. So it says, um, if growth charts start showing a different pattern, is there a problem? Well, look at these growth charts, okay? So see how in the very back it says stature for age and then weight for age? Well, what they've done is um, you actually put like your age and years is at the bottom and then this one is stature so it's height so um, and then they you would figure out your height and then you just match those up and that's where you put yourself on your 
in this chart. Okay. It says, um, and they just measure your pattern of growth. It's not that, that an upper percentile is better than a lower percentile or the other way around. As let's say a child was growing along the same pattern until they were two and then suddenly started growing at a much slower rate than other kids. This might indicate a health problem. But they can tell by charting it and looking to see where they are. Because if a growth chart shows a different pattern, is there a problem? Not necessarily. The doctor will interpret the growth charts depending on their overall well-being. Okay? Is, are they meeting other milestones? So are they talking appropriately? Are they doing other things appropriately? How tall are, or heavy are the child's parents and siblings? Were they born premature? Did they start puberty earlier? They can make their growth work. Okay, so those are all kids measured on one growth chart. Next page. Um, we actually put girls and boys on different ones. One set of charts is used for babies, birth to 36 months, and then another one is used for kids 2 to 20 years old. And then there's other ones. So, um, anyways, we'll stop there. And then we'll, I do want you guys, if you will, tomorrow, whenever you come in here, read the rest of this. Main thing I want you guys to understand is what are percentiles down here? Read that. Um, actually, just read that whole rest of that section. And we can talk about it some next week, too. And then tomorrow, what I want you guys to do is go ahead. Actually, just read the rest of that. Read this that talks about BMI, too. And so tomorrow, I just want you guys to plot. Get your height and weight back there and plot yourselves on here. The percentiles are these little numbers on the sides of these lines, like third, fifth, tenth, fifth, and so forth. Um, and then the other thing I want you guys to do tomorrow, whenever you come, and then I'll let you guys go, is um, I want you guys to get. Measure your body mass index. How about we use our finger? Do what? How about we use our finger? No, no, no. Um, anyways, and you just kind of follow the instructions on here, and this wheel gives you your BMI, or you can use this one where you just turn it on and you enter, it'll tell you what to do. You enter in like your height and weight and your age and all that, and it'll actually give you your BMI. Anyways, if you don't, if you get all that done, great. If you don't, then you can keep up with it. That's kind of stressful. Okay. Don't forget to have the potatoes tomorrow.